Welcome. Uh, this is the week number six. That is the module six, and I will start from today the steel making. So far, we have discussed about the blast furnace iron making all details. I will start the steel making, and before I start the steel making, I will just give a brief history of the steel making. Okay. Um, what I will discuss basically the wrought iron. That is the very uh, primitive iron is the wrought iron and then I will take a talk about the evolution of the cast iron and finally the steel and also I will talk about the modern steel making evolution of the modern steel making process. So wrought iron, wrought iron there is the earliest sample of the wrought iron is obtained in the British Museum. In the British Museum we can find it is around dead backs to 3000 BC before Christ. And what is wrought iron? Wrought iron is basically and uh, solid state that is the iron that is produced in the solid state. Okay, That is if you just heat an iron ore in presence of carbon then you can have uh, you can take out the oxygen that is just like what you call it DRI today. But that time it was much more primitive and uh, in fact um, they invented iron possibly there is the story goes like that they are preparing some uh, animal food uh, in a outside oven that is by that is that they used to eat by basically baking the things. So, they were baking some mice and uh, at that time in the adjacent side they have obtained some hard material that is called the iron possibly iron stone was there iron ore was there and the carbonaceous material they used to burn the things. So, in presence of carbon they produce the iron that is the study goes. So, that is the solid state reduction and then followed by squeezing of the slag by hammering basically iron ore contain lot of gangs. So, if you heat up at certain temperatures say at little high temperature you can do above 1000 degree centigrade and that you can do by burning the coal even in the presence of cold air and uh, then you can produce above 1000 degree centigrade and then you can directly reduce the iron ore. What happens is that since it you cannot go to the liquid state because it requires much higher temperature and at that time those temperature was not available basically the what is the oven used to run by uh, cold air blast by natural draft that is to go and then carbonaceous material basically was there and that will burn it and then temperature may be 1000 1100 degrees centigrade that you can attain maximum. So, the material will remain solid and uh, what will happen is that you can take out the oxygen from the ore you can make it iron but at the same time the gang will be there along with it maybe in the semi solid state because some of the slag constituents may form the eutectic and they will be in the semi solid state at 1100 degree centigrade so then what you have to do if you hammer the material then the slag will be squeezed out and uh, partially some of the slag will be intermixed with the there is the iron produced okay that is called the wrought iron. So, why the rod has come basically from working basically if you work on it that is called from that it is it has come basically wrought iron okay solid state reduction followed by squeezing of slag by hammering that is called the wrought iron. Now, it is produced in the bloomery basically short cylindrical furnace and operated with the natural drop as I said and you can find a picture of it. So, you can find this is the hole and the air goes through it by natural draft and they made some cylindrical right cylindrical furnace and it's made of stone and then inside they used to put the iron ore coal coal whatever it may be and then by natural draft air used to go and they used to cook for a long time overnight say and the morning they kind they get some kind of uh, metalized iron that is that they can get some uh, the iron ore could be reduced and form a metalized iron and then they can take out that iron and then they used to hammer it. If you hammer it after that you can squeeze out uh, most of the slag, but some of the slag obviously will be intermixed with the iron and that is called the wrought iron and it has some very special quality. And the iron pillar, pillar that is exist in Delhi that is made of this wrought iron only and uh, the inscription on the iron pillar says that it is made in the Chandragupta 2 made that and his name is written there 
some in their alphabets, old alphabets, and uh, it is around 400 after Christ, okay, 400 years after Christ, early 400, there is this Mauja dynasty that time. So, and then you can find this is the iron ore in the Delhi, and uh, its diameter is around 40 centimeter, height around 7 meter, and estimated weight around 6 tons, okay, this is the, you can, by density you can do that thing, so. And uh, this iron, the most marvelous thing is that about this very fascinating thing about it is, it is staying for more than 1500 years, but you cannot find any rusting. That is the most inter interesting thing. Excellent corrosion resistance. And it is because a lot of research has gone basically some, and then they found there is a protective layer, a very passive protective layer over the surface that basically restricted from the atmospheric oxidation. And it may be due to the processing, the art of processing, and they find that the three factors, that is the processing, structure, and the composition of the iron, okay. So, as a result, this intermixed slag basically gives this protective layer. They form some passive oxide layer outside and then never allow any penetration of the oxygen inside it. So, as a result, not only oxygen, moisture, anything cannot penetrate inside it because of this passive layer formation. And it is attributed to the processing structure and composition. As I said, it is an intermix with the slag. That may be one of the reason. And then that iron contains a lot of phosphorus. So some hydrated phosphate, something they have found on the wall that basically restrict is from this oxidation. So this is about the wrought iron. This is the very primitive. Uh, you can consider this as a steel also because the wrought iron carbon diffusion will be very less. So, in fact, it is almost a pure iron intermixed with the slag and carbon percentage will be very less because in solid state reduction iron uh, carbon do not penetrate too much. So, it is very malleable from that point of view and then there is the thing. So, this is the wrought iron and it is uh, before Christ, okay. And then let us see the cast iron. Why? The, what does this mean? Cast iron means basically you have to make now the liquid iron and then you can cast it into a different shape that is called the cast iron. And if you see the cast iron, cast iron was first produced even before the Christian era in China. And uh, in the Chinese museum you can get some big, big objects of this is the cast iron date back to 1000 AD, 1000, 1000 AD after Christ. So, those things are there in China. And next significant development that is after, uh, and then this technology basically moved towards the Europe and next significant development is the Spanish province of Catalonia, Catal Catalonia that is called the Catalan Forge. And what is the characteristic or unique thing is that they use the water wheels to blow the air. So now, so far they used to produce under natural draft. Obviously, natural draft was very smooth. That is the flow of velocity of the air will be less or partial pressure of oxygen will be less. But if you can use water wheels, obviously you can give air at a much faster rate. So, partial pressure of oxygen will also be high. That is the more blast rate is increasing. So, partial pressure is high. So, you can attain little higher temperature also because the reaction kinetics will be faster and you can attain little higher temperature. And at that temperature, it was possible to melt the iron, carburized iron, I will say. It is not the pure iron, but carburized iron, which melt around 1200 degrees centigrade. So, that temperature was possible by the water wheels to blow the air. And they used to produce around per 12 hours 100 kg, 100 kg per 12 hours. So, it is significantly increased. And then came the Stukhofen, okay, in Germany, that Stukhofen furnace, that is the height increased by 5 meter. And interior superior refractory lining was there to restrict the heat loss to the atmosphere. So, they made that and its shape is more or less like a modern blast furnace and so it is called the forerunner of the modern blast furnace and it used to produce 100 to 150 tons per annum. So, quite large amount at that time. And then so far all this furnace used to run by the charcoal, wood charcoal. And then it was replaced by the coke in Dudley, by Dudley in 1709, this is the early 18th century. So, in UK, 
So, this is a great innovation that is the charcoal is replaced by coke obviously in that case you can increase the height of the furnace because coke is more stronger compared to the charcoal. Charcoal cannot bear much of low much of overburden so it fragment and produce dust but coke will not as a result with the introduction of the coke you can increase the furnace height and also the productivity. And then came the steam engine for blowing the air. Now, if the if you have an engine, then this is a force convection. Now you are giving the water wheel did not have so much of power. So when you introduce a steam engine, it has much more power. So you can deliver much more air per unit. That is the part ton of iron. So blast rate you can increase by that time. So so steam engine air blowing introduced 1760 and increase the size and productivity of the furnace. So, you can increase the size and productivity because you can supply uh, more air now. Blast rate can be increased. You can burn more amount of carbon also for unit time. Okay. So, productivity increased. Then came the preheating of the air blast in 1829 by the nation and this is very interesting because if you can preheat the air then obviously, you can supply lot of sensible heat through the air and you can supplement some of the heat supplied by the coke and uh, so as a result your coke rate decreased. So, coke rate decreased from 8 ton to 5 ton. So, that was the initial that thing and then further modification increased that is the by preheating temperature from 150 to 600 degree centigrade and the fire brick linings regenerative Cooper stove that is the Cooper stove for preheating the air blast came in 1857 that is an in the 19th century mid 19th century that is you get the Cooper stove that is the modern uh, stove but with a much higher preheat temperature now you can attain 1200 that time 600 degree centigrade you can attain by that Cooper stove. So, it increased the preheating temperature and reduce the coke rate and then came double bell charging in 1880 double bell charging there is a charging system we understood the importance of the charging system otherwise uh, it was polluting the atmosphere because where you are charging the gas can escape through that. So, lot of pollution will be there. So, once come the bill top double bill charging you can restrict the gas leakage through the charging. So, that was so pollution point of view it was very good also the burden distribution point of view also and then gas cleaning that is the electrostatic precipitator when it came then gas cleaning become more effective and then utilization of the blast furnace gas for the gas heating that is the Cooper stove as well as downstream application came and further development we have discussed already the modern blast furnace development how the coke rate decreased over the time I have already discussed. So, this is the primitive that is uh, how the cast iron evolved over the time that is the so it was there actually. Uh, started from pre-Christian era, era that is the BC it started the cast iron was started in China and then progressively it moves to the Europe and then a lot of development take place on the cast iron. So, rest of the development in modern blast furnace I have already discussed. Now, I will go about the steel how the steel developed basically first is the cementation as I said that is the wrought iron is basically a very pure form of iron. Okay, and with a very low percentage of carbon and also I say it that is the pure iron is very malleable, it is very ductile but strength is not that much. So, if we increase the strength if you give some amount of carbon some impurities into it then strength increases and increases as you know as a physical metallurgist because of lot of strengthening mechanism come into picture solid solution hardening and uh, precipitation hardening, dislocation by love all these things are there. So, you know lot of strengthening mechanism come in when come carbon goes into this system. Now, too much carbon again not good because it makes the iron very brittle. So, up to 2 percent carbon you can have different kinds of steel, mild steel, medium carbon steel and high carbon steel and those are malleable still and with a high strength. So, there is the wrought iron was also very very that is the strength was not very high because the carbon percentage was very less. So, people felt to increase his hardness. So, then what is that? There is the heating the wrought iron in presence of carbon in stone box that is called a cementation process. What you can do? You can increase the carbon into the wrought iron that was the thing, but 
if you do that is the carbon will increase in the surface area only because the penetration to the center will take lot of time. So, that was not possible. So, this type of wrought iron cemented wrought iron was very hard on the surface, but very ductile inside it core remained very ductile and the surface become hard. Okay. So, that was the that was called the steel. So, it is a reverse steel making first you produce a pure iron and then you incorporate the carbon into it. Unlike today what you do, you produce a hot metal liquid iron with lot amount of carbon and then we purify it to reduce the carbon to the level where the strength and ductility is optimum, right? that is called the steel. But here first we, they produce the wrought iron because of temperature limitation, wrought iron and then they introduce the carbon and then produce the steel. So, it is reverse way of making the steel. So, cementation. And then wood steel that is wood steel was available in India in Tamil Nadu area and this wood word has come basically from the word ukku in Tamil called the fire. So, wood steel it was a very famous steel and it was the most advanced material during that period in 200 to 300 BC it was in India even after AD up to actually a lot of time around 1000 years after that also wood steel was only the advanced material in the world and it was a fantastic quality it has with a strength and ductility. The wood steel uh, is basically a carburized wrought iron only and uh, possibly they produce the way the processing and all these things detail is not known but major thing is that they take the wrought iron first produce wrought iron and then carburized it. But the steel has a very good quality and this steel this is the famous Damascus sword was made of in the Middle East was made from the wood steel because wood steel was only the very high quality steel at this time and it is exported to different areas okay, including this Middle East and where they produce the Damascus steel with this in producing it they further they hammered the wood steel maybe the number of pieces of the wood, uh, wood steel was hammered to form some kind of ingot and then hammering to produce a sword and then heat treatment of the sword was very important. There is special heat treatment quenching, air quenching, normalizing whatever it may be. And then the sword that was obtained is a fantastic quality and uh, today now it is known that it is an alternate bands of cementite in the matrix of temper martensite or pearlite that is the structure. So, and it has a very high carbon steel with a excellent plasticity is possibly the high carbon only limited on the surface. So, surface become very high hard that is the that is required for the short, but the center was very ductile. So, you can hammer it easily. So, it was hammered and moved away. So, all this thing basically give a very excellent this is the this is the Damascus steel texture of the Damascus steel it looks like this. So, and then after this wood steel, this area basically wrought iron and cementation, this is area we came the first liquid steel making because liquid steel making requires a very high temperature because uh, and uh, that was first Huntsman in UK 1740. He was, he could make the steel in the crucible, obviously the carburized steel. So, uh, with the chemical fuel with the cold air cold air and the chemical fuel burnt and then whatever the temperature around 1400 degree centigrade, but by that temperature the you can melt a high carbon uh, that is the carburized uh, wrought iron. So, he, he was the first person who melt the carburized wrought iron and to homogenize the mixture with the carbon right. So, that was the thing. So, this is called the crucible he could make in the crucible in a very small scale. And in the large tonne scale first steel making came in the Bresumer process in 1860 I will talk about that thing. And then alloy steel is a very recent phenomena it is maybe 100 years old it is the early 20th century there is the alloy steel came. And uh, so, modern steel making I will talk about some modern steel making. So, to start with uh, let us talk about the Bresumer there is the Henry Bresumer he invented this technique in 1860. Okay. So, what is that basically this is a is the first economic tonnage liquid steel production from the molten free iron. So, that is the 152 uh, 52 uh, or 10 to 50 tons basically that time lot of basically you see by that time that is the cast iron was 
people were making the custard in the stew coven. Stew coven, lot of liquid iron was being formed, and th these were cast. But so several places the liquid iron was there. So Bene Besema wanted to convert those liquid iron to steel. That is to purify the liquid iron. Okay, to take out the impurities. Okay, by oxidation. So that was the first. Uh, that time and it was needed at that time. Iron purification by purging of air into the melt. So this is the furnace will show. This is the autogenous process because autogenous process because you are purifying the uh, liquid iron by oxygen. You are oxidizing the impurities like carbon, silicon, manganese, and as a result, you are generating a lot of heat because all these oxidation reactions are exothermic. So it was an autogenous process. No external heat supply was required. But it was just sufficient to purify the hot metal. So you cannot use any extra cold material. That is the scrap you want to melt into the basement, not possible. Because it was just sufficient to convert a liquid iron to the steel. Okay. So it was autogenous that way. And then process modified by the Thomas for basic steel making and no cold charge acceptance as I said. And this is the furnace look like. This is the furnace. It is very much to the modern uh, basic oxygen furnace. Only thing is that here the oxygen in the form of air was introduced from the bottom of the furnace. You can find a lot of holes are there through which the air was passed. And as the air goes, and then oxygen in the air react with the impurities and uh, oxidize them. And uh, carbon monoxide, carbon get oxidized to so carbon monoxide goes away to the atmosphere and the other silica, manganese, phosphorus were oxidized and, and collected into the slag. But initially the phosphorus removal was not possible for the re own reason you know you cannot remove the phosphorus preferentially without you make the slag basic. That is why that is the Thomas modified this process for the basic steel making basically make the lining basic and also use lime such that you can reduce the phosphorus content significantly, right. So before that, before Besemer process was an acid process, it is called the acid because the slag is acidic and there you can all remove the carbon, silicon, manganese, not phosphorus. So when Thomas modified this process with the basic lining and lime, limey slag, then he could remove the phosphorus also. So it was a perfect. Uh, refining unit was there, unit was established. And then the major drawback of this process was high nitrogen because you are charging air, not oxygen as we do today. So it was charging the air, air contains 79 by volume percent nitrogen. So that nitrogen dissolved into the liquid still to great extent because obviously because the air bubble moves and the bath was not very deep, so shallow bath. So oxygen residence time was here, residence time was not very high. But by that time obviously a lot of nitrogen also goes into the steel. So nitrogen content was around 200 ppm. So it is quite high, 200 ppm very high and nitrogen makes very brittleness into the steel. And nozzle maintenance was another problem. The maintenance of the nozzles was another problem because from the bottom you charge the air. So there is always chance, chance of flooding the nozzle by the liquid head. So later on the nozzle uh, Thomas also uh, shifted this nozzle to the site such the nozzle problem decreases significantly. But this furnace has limitation of no cold charge acceptance as well as high nitrogen content of the liquid still. So that is why they went for some time but they are not sustainable. But this is the forerunner I will say this is the forerunner of the modern. LD furnace because only change is that you are charging now pure oxygen and that too when the chief oxygen production came into picture and then it was shifted to pure oxygen furnace. So now oxygen is lanced from the top in the LD otherwise reactor looked like this. So then came the open heart furnace why the open heart Siemens Martin in 1861 they designed some furnace that is the chemically that is the chemical and there is the fuel fired furnace that can melt the scrap that was the needed at the time because you are generating the steel by Bessemer process that is the scrap and then a lot of scrap was evolving and then how to utilize those scrap that was the need. But 
there was no furnace available to melt those scrap at that time 1861. So, parallelly two furnaces basically evolved to melt the scrap one is called the open earth furnace that is fuel fired furnace and similarly after few times that is the electric arc furnace also came into picture that also could melt the scrap. So, externally heated furnace was required and Siemens Martin both brothers Siemens brothers and Martin brothers they developed uh, this process a process where a fuel fired furnace with the regenerative principle uh, can melt the coal charge right. So, first externally fuel fired furnace to attain the steel making temperature by heat regeneration principle. So, what is this heat regeneration principle this is the this is the furnace look like this is a very shallow furnace you can find this is the liquid metal and this and then what happens here is a fuel fired furnace. So, you here is the well warner is there and uh, you have the preheated air is coming from here. How it is preheated I am telling there is a preheated air this basically you burn the well by the air and then and that the exit gas when it comes out this is the exit gas in one cycle when the exit gas is achha, here the air is going ok. The exit gas suppose here the air is going and you have a well burner you are burning this and then exit gas is coming out when the exit gas come out then there is a checker brick works were right there. So, checker brick works as I say it is nothing but a brick works with a lot of surface area such that your heat exchange become very effective and then the brick can retain the heat ok. So, here the air is coming and then they exchange the heat with the brick and brick get heated up and they store the temperature uh, store the heat and the air comes out that is then goes to the stack. In the next cycle what they do basically when similarly it is heated up now. Now, it is already heated up and the air is going it will air get preheated and then preheated air comes burns the oil and the exit gas come and then again it heats the brick works. In the next cycle what will happen that is it will be on the air and it will be on the heating and the air will go it will be preheated and it will be burned at the well burner and the exit gas will come and then it will again preheat this brickwork and then come out. So, this is in two cycles it runs. So, you can so chemical fuel that is the you know, Benjamin Huntsman what he did basically he burned the chemical fuel, but in with the cold air. Now, what they are doing they are burning the same chemical fuel, but with a that is the preheated air that is the difference as a result you can increase the furnace temperature to the steel making temperature. Steel making temperature means basically when you are making the steel from the liquid iron you are reducing the carbon. So, its liquid as goes up. So, temperature goes. So, furnace temperature required around 1600 degrees centigrade because 1539 is the pure liquid iron melting temperature. So, it little higher for you have you should have the gas temperature little higher for the heat transfer. So, around 1600 degrees centigrade is required and that was possible by that time. So, with this preheating. So, preheated air along with this oil chemical fuel you can generate a very high temperature in the furnace that is able to melt the scrap. Scrap is also very low carbon iron. So, its liquidus is quite high. So, you should have a very high temperature ok. So, first fuel fired furnace to accept 100 percent steel scrap that was very much needed at that time because steel was being produced by Bessemer. So, lot of steel scrap was also being produced. So, those steel scrap was very much required to be molded by external heating furnace. So, iron is used as an in this furnace how does it work basically use the iron ore as an oxidizing agent and it is a very shallow bath because heat is transferred only from the top and it goes down it. And also uh, it is a very quiescent bath that is very and as a result only the when the carbon comes out in the form of bubbles it generates some mixing or some starting into the bath otherwise bath is not very it is not it it is mild bath that is not start bath that much only during the carbon coming out that is called the carbon boil then some mixing is there. So, that is why the bath is kept shallow only for the heat and mass transfer point of view. And uh, iron ore is used as an oxidizing agent that is the source of iron and then and but uh, you can produce the clean steel here because no nitrogen is coming because iron ore you are using directly oxygen source you are not using the air. So, nitrogen was very low, hydrogen was less 
and very slow process around 10 hours and then you can cook the material as you want you can cook any kind of alloy steel okay that was possible because you have lot of time okay to make any kind of steel but major problem is the time that is the time and later on the open earth furnace not only for the scrap melting later on uh, when it was developed later stage it was uh, handling the liquid iron also liquid iron co contains lot of uh, that is the impurities as a result the slag volume in the furnace was also increasing and it was very difficult to handle a lot large amount of the slag volume that's why they make some port here at the top that is called the flash point when the slag exceed that point then it will automatically flash off from the furnace as a result the liquid height will remain constant the slag height will remain constant so that is the flash uh, slag technique was introduced when they were uh, in business of treating the liquid uh, metal also because it was uh, this open earth furnace was also connected with the integrated steel plant for some time and, and there it was uh, handling both the scrap as well as the liquid iron so then it was converted to twin heart furnace this is the furnace was divided into two parts one part two parts and one part was on preheating uh, preheating and other part was on the melting preheating means when the exit gas is coming out a part of the gas is used up for preheating and obviously the whatever the sensibility is available that was sufficient to preheat this checker works so to shorten the time period so you can in one half you can preheat it so you can and the other part you can melt it so to shorten the time this twin heart furnace also came flash slack practice was there but anyway this uh, furnace could not compete once the an ld furnace took up so but, but it, it, ld furnace came around 1950 and this is around 1861 so 100 years open earth furnace also served the purpose of making the steel to great extent okay but because of a very long time 10 hours time and later on it was reduced to 6 hours but still it was quite large time requirement for refining the steel so oxygen this is the basic oxygen furnace and this is the oxygen first came into picture when the chief oxygen produced by linde frankel process give birth basically to the bf process because linde frankel process bring the very cheap oxygen from here they could separate the oxygen in a cheap way so technology was such that that is you can produce a cheap oxygen production so cheap oxygen production by linde frankel basically give birth to the bf process and oxygen lensing obviously since oxygen is there oxygen lensing was done from the top in this furnace and uh, tap to tap time was only 45 minutes because here the refining uh, characteristic is different since the oxygen come from the top and the emulsion is formed in the uh, above the slag layer okay emulsion basically first uh, a foam formation take place slag foam and in the slag foam lot of metal ion metal droplet joins and that forms an emulsion and basically the refining of uh, liquid metal uh, take place into the emulsion only where the surface area is tremendous and that is the i will talk about that that's why it is only 45 minutes so this is you can see the furnace look like almost bessemer furnace only it is rounded here to facilitate the mass transfer and you can find this oxygen lensing is there and this is the emulsion where basically the surface area is slag metal surface area is tremendous you can carry out the refining very short time so from 10 hours or maybe 6 hours so it is 45 minutes only and the first pilot plant was set up in Linge and Dunavich in 2 to 5 ton in 1949 that is 1950 so after that once LD came into picture then slowly the open heart phased out because of very large time requirement from productivity point of view presently its capacity is 100 to 400 ton there is the ld furnace is available nowadays okay it is also an autogenous process not only autogenous because oxygen is coming but since the partial pressure oxygen is very high here your basically heat generation is also quite high so you can accept some amount of cold charge also and then came the elliptic arc furnace i said the elliptic arc furnace was introduced uh, that is two type of uh, electric steel making there one is based on the electric arc and heat source is electric arc as you can understand and first successful commercial application was by herald in 19, 1899 okay so 
and then suitable for the small industry 50 to 100 tons it was there and you can mail the scrap and produce any kind of alloy steel because it has a lot of flexibility in the refining i will talk about that flexibility to the input material also you can take any proportion of the hot metal if required because if you want to take this furnace in integrated steel plant also it is possible nowadays and you can take any kind of raw metal mix and uh, bigger EF for integrated steel plant is also 150 to 300 ton now it is also coming. Okay, induction furnace as, as the name suggests basically heat is generated by the eddy current dissipation into the hot metal. So, eddy current is generated into the hot metal and then or the scrap or whatever the metal you are giving that is the scrap you are giving. So, eddy current will be generated then that will melt the that is those uh, scrap and then and it has a very good mixing I will come about that thing and then refining is limited I will talk about that thing. So, this is the thing that is the your induction furnace was there. So, here basically his source of heat basically eddy current dissipation into the charge material and that basically melt it and finally, refining also take place to some extent, but it is mainly for the scrap melting and limited refining. So, this is the electric arc uh, steel making there is two is one is the electric arc furnace and is the induction furnace and ok. So, this is the reference mostly Ghoshchadarji and conclusion there is the wrought iron and carbodized wrought iron were excellent steel in the ancient time with superior quality combined effect of processing structure and composition of the iron is supposed to be that is the responsible for very excellent quality of those steels at those time that is uh, very corrosion resistance and then very and then the wood steel those are the and uh, modern liquid steel making evolved through the bessemer to open heart to basic oxygen steel making and electric arc steel making also. The electric steel making are suitable for small industry to convert the scrap to a liquid, liquid steel basically scrap to steel. Nowadays they are also making inroads to the integrated steel making as I said because now bigger electric arc furnace is coming and they can they have a flexibility in the raw material they can take uh, any proportion of liquid steel with the coal charges that is the most advantage and coal charges are scrap it can be the DRI nowadays. So, so this is a very brief history and thank you very much.